Hello and welcome to Filibustering History, a podcast series where we discuss what historians do with their lives. From scenic Ohio, I am Rob Denning, lead faculty for the history programs at Southern New Hampshire University's College of Online and Continuing Education. Joining me from sunny California is James Fennessy, the Associate Dean of Faculty for History at SNHU. Today we are talking to Yun Chun Suzy Chung, a public historian, a team lead, and an adjunct faculty at SNHU. And, according to the organizers of a recent conference where she presented her work, a, quote, super museologist, unquote. Today we're going to discuss her research interests, her work with professional organizations such as the International Conference of Museums, and her experiences with presenting her work at conferences and in print. And in doing so, we're going to figure out exactly why she deserves the title of super museologist. What is your name and what do you do? Hello, my name is Yansan Suzy Chang, and I'm a team lead and adjunct faculty of Southern New Hampshire University. And I'm so excited and honored to be a part of your podcast series. Why don't you start out by just telling us a little bit about your background. What got you interested in history and how did you academically move into studying history? So my undergraduate degree was actually in French language and literature at Yonsei University. Uh, as my family moved back to Seoul, Korea, and I went with them after graduating from high school in Los Angeles, California. It was in graduate school that I changed my major to museology or museum studies at the Rheinwert Academy in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And then in 2002, I graduated from the University of Cambridge with a PhD in the history and philosophy of County Archaeological Society Museums in mid 19th century England. So this is where history came in. So before I graduated, I was hired by Texas Tech University in 2001 to start the Heritage Management Graduate Program. So, and since then I've been teaching, I've been developing curricula, conducting research, I've been publishing, working on projects, and I've been committed to professional and community service. I resigned the position of associate professor at San Francisco State University to move to Chicago, Illinois with my family. And now here I am, so pleased to be a part of SNU's liberal arts community in the history program, focusing on public history. And the real advantage of working at SNU is that online teaching and learning is the wave of the future of universal access to higher education and teaching. Great, can you maybe provide us with a little bit more information on your experiences at San Francisco State University. Both you and I have that SFSU connection. So I'd be interested in hearing how you came about getting that job and then making that difficult decision to give up what most <laughs> what most adjunct instructors dream of right now. I've always been interested in that part of your background and would love to hear a little bit more about it. So after six years teaching at the Museum Science and Heritage Management Graduate Program, at, in Lubbock, Texas, Texas Tech University. I left for San Francisco State University's Museum Studies program. Uh, it, it's the same kind of courses that they were teaching as well. And I was hired as an associate professor. I stayed there for one year. Basically, I was teaching all the public history courses that I'm teaching now. I also taught marketing and public relations in museums and interpretation in museums. So basically similar courses at new. And so in all of these, you know, your various adventures in academia and all of that, what, what have the, been the research interests that have kind of fueled you during all of this? You've been touching on a lot of public history type activities, but what are the actual topics that interest you and that kind of propelled you through your academic programs? So it actually very diverse and it ranges from the history and philosophy of museums to heritage management. And I've published in journals such as Collections, a journal for museums and archives professionals, and also the International Council of Museums International Committee for Museology Study Series and other journals as well. And it comes from all the projects I've worked on as a public historian and faculty in projects in projects such as 34th Street, Lubbock, Texas Heritage Management and Tourism. I've published a tourism brochure. I've inventoried heritage for Lamb County for the Texas 
Plains Trail. I've conducted cultural natural resources heritage planning uh, in collaboration with the Office of Economic Development in Littlefield and Texas Tech University. Also, I've worked on long-term archaeological historic survey preservation project. And I've also cataloged Getty funded photographic collections at the Cambridge University Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. And I also worked on uh, inventorying pottery from excavations at Axum in Ethiopia for the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research, which is a part of the Department of Archaeology at the University of Cambridge. And these experiences have actually connected me to a broad range of public history. And for all these projects, I've had to seek grants. They've entailed producing separate documents, and they've come to fruition in the form of publications. Yeah, and one of the things that has been really noteworthy about your career is the kind of the volume of publications and the number of conference presentations that you've been doing. And one of the most recent conferences that you were, I'm aware of anyway, is this one that you recently had in Cuba, of all places, which sounds very exotic and a whole lot of fun. But could you tell us a bit about that conference, what drew you to that conference, and how that, just to tell us a little bit about how that conference worked? I represented SNU's history program and UNESCO's ICOM U.S. member at the 40th ICAFOM Annual Symposium in Havana, Cuba. And my peer-reviewed paper, which was entitled the Poetics and Geopolitics of Interpretation and Nonprofit versus Income Generator of the Function of Museums, very long title, was presented at the symposium. And I was also awarded an ICAFON travel grant to present that paper. So my intention for participating in that symposium was to share my international experiences, the presentation and publication information on museology, public history, with my fellow American faculty and students at SNU's graduate program in history. And so here I am. And just to talk a little bit about my experience there, uh, despite Hurricane Irma, which damaged the coastline of Cuba, the conference was successfully held at the Interpretation Center for Cultural Relations between Cuba and Europe at the Palacio del Segundo Cabo, Plaza de Armas. And this was actually a joint meeting with ICAFON, ICAFON LAM, or Latin America, and ICOM LAC, or Latin America and Caribbean Alliance. So my paper was reflecting on the museological theories and contemporary practices of collecting and exhibiting, and what I like to call the 21st century free range interpretation. This idea is where we look at visitors going to museums, being involved in a participatory action of labeling contexts of exhibits, which now empower museums to voice their arguments about geopolitics and race, and the poetics of displays, uh, integrating art, sound, and technology in traditional natural history museums. And I also looked at the implications of the structure and context that objects actually have lives through different ownership. And this has also been discussed in museology li literature, public history literature. So one of the things that's always mm -hmm. fascinated me about mm -hmm. you is the diversity of topics that you're interested in. And I, I'm sure that everybody would like to know, actually, especially students, um, is how you come up with the idea for a project. You know, you're, you're obviously not in a class. You're not assigned a specific topic that you need to research. So where do you draw inspiration for all of these various projects? And how do you even begin to research them? I think the best way is to start with joining a professional organization. And my first organization was with the International Council of Museums and with the International Committee for Museology, which looks at the theory and philosophy of museums. And it ranges from the history, it ranges to ethics, but we look at the theoretical components, but also in connection with the practice and functions of museums. Joining a professional organization is the first step to presenting a paper and publishing a paper, because usually they'll hold annual conferences and they will be sending out a call for abstract or a call for papers or 
uh, a call for articles, and that's where students should begin. Great. I'm sure that a lot of students would be interested in that because one of the things that we really need to start getting better at is explaining to students what these professional organizations are. You know, a lot of our students probably aren't going to go on to become professional historians. We have a lot of students that are trying to get a master's degree because they're actually teachers, or they might be interested in other careers and avenues. But these professional associations can help them no matter what career they decide to go into. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a high school social studies teacher or somebody who's gone on to work as a curator in a museum. Uh, being a member of these professional organizations is really important. And I think one of the things that you just identified is really important too, understanding that as a historian or as somebody who's studied history and received a degree in it, that you become part of a larger community. And these are actually communities where you have conversations, where people are interested in continuing to do research and that, like your experiences in these presentations and at these conferences, people are actually doing this research because they're genuinely interested in these things. They're coming together to present their ideas and to discuss and to debate. And it's it can be really exciting. I remember I've, I've attended a, a handful of conferences in, in my time. And that was one of the, you know, and I've attended others where I didn't present more recently, but I went to support uh, a friend, and I just remember that feeling of excitement when you're sitting there listening to, you know, to somebody who's not in academia. It probably sounds absolutely ridiculous, but <laughs> that feeling of excitement where you're listening to an argument and you're listening to the research that they've done, and you see how connected they are to it and how much work they put into it and how much potential there is for these topics, and it really is something that's infectious, I think, in a good way, obviously. Yeah, I've had uh, similar experiences with that, too. If there's huge mega conferences, you know, like the American Historical Association's annual meetings in uh, January each year, which are in different cities each year, but those ones are massive. Those are like the Disney World of, of history conferences. But there are a lot of smaller scale conferences that have a much more intimate atmosphere, um, and I've been to a bunch of those, too. The, the one international conference that I've been to was at the Business History Conference in uh, Milan, Italy, back in 2009, I want to say. Since it was a lot of us together in a foreign country, it kind of helped to reinforce the bit more intimate com nature of the conversations there. And so we ended up building a lot of really kind of long-lasting relationships with other scholars that we never would have met before because we were all kind of thrown together. And so a lot of us, because, you know, we had nothing else to do, well, I mean, you can wander around Italy, which is pretty cool, but, you know, there was nothing that was, there was no <laughs> families or anything that were distracting us. So we were just kind of, we would just hang out at the conference all day uh, and watch each other give presentations. And so there was a lot of conversations that spilled over into the breaks between conference presentations or between panels you know, or into the lunch hour or after the conference was over and everyone started flooding out into Milan and, you know, catching the train to other parts of Italy also. So there were a lot of conversations that continued on afterwards. Those conferences can create a really cool sense of community that can get lost when you're kind of pursuing your own thing or when you're even when you're publishing your own book. And you might have peer reviewers looking at your book or something, but you're not going to have the same breadth of conversations that you do at conferences, which, like you're saying, kind of makes it a kind of a special experience. Yeah, the opportunity to go to these different places. So it's just amazing. I Some of my first conferences in grad school took me to Hawaii each year, to, actually, to um, it was a pop culture conference. Oh, um, that's rough, so man. I presented. Yeah, it was it was really difficult. But uh, so I presented for a couple of years. You really have to have a great deal of passion for research and for presenting papers and publishing because you're not getting paid for this. Maybe you're getting paid if you're getting a grant or for the project, but most professors do this pro bono. And I'm not so centered on publishing, sell my book or article or because articles, you know, you don't sell them or pamphlets, tourism pamphlets. It's to share my expertise on what I love to do. And I don't know what else I would do. I don't know what else I would be capable of doing. So this is where I feel like I belong as a vocation. This sounds like a really interesting conference that you went to. And so you were there with a bunch of scholars, presumably from around the world, and everyone was giving presumably different interpretations of museums and how museums operate and all of that. What types of things did you learn from a conference like this? Is, is there anything that you walked away thinking differently or 
something that you might be able to apply either to your own work or maybe into your teaching? Were there any, any kind of lasting lessons that you're taking away from a conference like that? Yes, I learned a lot about Latin American museology. I learned a lot about Brazilian museology, Argentinian museology, and the museologists who have established or made the foundations of museum studies or public history in those countries. Now, this is interesting because you're talking about museology in Brazil and other countries. I, I am not an expert on museums. My expertise lies elsewhere. So as kind of an outsider looking in, it seems kind of surprising that there would be different versions of museology based on different countries. You would think that there's museums <laughs> and, they, and they operate the same everywhere. They have the same priorities. They have the same functions. They have the same, I don't know, business needs. That kind of thing. So how would you describe, well, obviously without going into too much detail about different countries and all of that, what do you think are some of the differences that you've seen in different museum, museology in tr perspectives from all these different countries? How, in what ways are they different? Well, there's not so much of a difference in thought within ICAFON because we're all kind of on the same wavelength of theory and philosophy that museums are activists that we have to think about the ethics of the practice, the ethics of interpretation being diverse, including the marginalized voices in society. And I think everybody there looking at the papers and looking at the diversity in the topics, that those are the things that we uh, focus upon. And those are the topics that are truly important to do research on. And that's really interesting. So in a way, even a conference like this, which is primarily based on museum, around museums, revolving around museums and all that, there is still a concern for telling the stories of people who had previously been left out. So in some ways, this is, in, in a lot of ways, history, the field has kind of moved in this direction over the last 30 or 40 years, where we want to try to tell the story of people that have been left out of earlier interpretations. And so it sounds like a similar thing is happening at the universities also. Is Do you think that's simply a kind of a, where we exist as a people these days? Or do you think museologists, if that's the proper word today, are they responding to the fact that people had been left out of earlier museum interpretations? Is this like a response to the past or is it a response to the present? Do you have any idea, any thoughts on that? Yes, because a lot of the practice, the traditional types of practices that we see in the history of museums is that curators, uh, museologists, they were focusing on the objects. They were focusing on, oh, let's preserve the objects. Let's see how well we preserve them. Not so much on how do we communicate that better to society, who's coming to our museums, who's not. And it's now focusing from an object center to a society centered approach to museums. We're looking at more about focus groups before we actually put up an exhibit. We're looking at doing more audience research and so are, are these relatively recent developments that the museologists and archivists and curators, they become more interested in previously marginalized people? Is this a recent development or has this been kind of evolving slowly over time or is this a sudden advancement? Because it sounds like this is becoming a much higher priority for a lot of people. And I, I can only assume in earlier generations, probably not. This has been a developing trend. We can look at the new museology. There are other theoretical museologists such as eco-museologists, where we're looking at a whole community, we're looking at the heritage, preserving the heritage, um, the ongoing developing of that heritage. And I want to give Taos, the World Heritage Site, as an example. They're an ongoing community, developing heritage site that's preserved at the same time. But at the same time, the inhabitants are still there living, and it's their way of looking at how they want to com communicate their society, their heritage. In some ways, it's an interaction between the present and the past. And so I imagine 
earlier generations of curators and all of that, I imagine, were probably influenced by, I don't know if I want to say colonial mindset, but there was kind of this idea that there is a certain way that, that we should be presenting the past in public institutions, and that way is based on Western-style museology, probably. But I imagine that currently there's probably a movement towards trying to portray more respect towards the local people. In earlier generations, their own history was probably imposed on them by this European way of thinking, but that presumably is probably falling by the wayside, and so there's probably a bit more of an attempt to try to make it more accurately reflect the, the actual experience of people on the ground and the perspectives of those people on the ground. Is that kind of what you're getting yeah. at there? Post-colonialism, yes. There we go. So here's the question that I have, and this might seem ridiculously obvious, but I'm not sure if we've actually covered it in detail, but why museum studies? What's the connection that students who are interested in history and getting a history degree, what's the connection between history degrees and museum studies degrees? How can you marry the two? And what direction can you go in with a history MA or even a history uh, BA if you want to get involved with museum studies? What's the relevance to the study of history to museum studies? Well, basically what we're doing now, what public history is doing, we're concentrating on the museums, the archives, the libraries, how they practice museum work. And a lot of the topics that these institutions look at are historical, art historical. So theses that the students work on are online exhibits or planning of physical exhibits, archival management, oral history, transcriptions. This is what most of the museums and archives and libraries do. So I imagine there are some institutions that have degree programs in things like library sciences, library studies, museum studies. I imagine that you probably need a mix of both in institutions like you're talking about here. So museums are probably going to need to have some people that are focusing on that are specialists in libraries and in museum studies and all that, probably to maybe to run the day-to-day -day operations or something, but you also need historians to kind of provide the content for what those folks are doing. So I imagine there's probably some sort of a synthesis there where you're going to have the museum studies folks working with history folks. Is that kind of how it plays out, or do you see something different happening? Well, yes. So when I was teaching museum studies, Everybody would be coming from different backgrounds. Many of them were history majors. And it doesn't matter what field you're coming from, the practice is going to be similar. And it's just the topic of research that's going to differ. But even within our public history capstone course, we have so many diverse topics that the students are relating to, but the projects are going to be similar. So the approach, the steps in which we take, that's what we're teaching in our program is that they have developed their historical research methods through this entire two-year master's program. Finally, they're going to show that in a physical or intangible form uh, virtually in their project. And that's what museums and libraries and archives do. So, Susie, I think you brought up a really great point about how somebody who's studying and getting a degree in public history, you know, how the traditional approaches of a historian, the research and the process of developing work relates to public history. What about the other way around? I mean, we're moving into an era where digital humanities and digital history are really relevant, where even if you're going into a traditional track history program and then trying to get, you know, a traditional history job, whatever that is, whether it's a, a professor or or something along those lines, that you still need to be savvy with digital tools. You still need to know how to market yourself because there's so much competition out there. So what applications or what lessons can traditional history students learn from public history? How do you see that working in the opposite direction? Our program, as you may already know, we teach how to use web publishing platforms to create online exhibits or transcribe. And one of the programs is called Omeka. So that's really a starting point in what historians can do. I use web publishing platforms to present their work because even if you do become a traditional scholar at a university, 
in many cases, you may be working on public projects. And this is where that traditional historian becomes a public historian. And in order to remain a scholar, you have to do projects, you have to publish, you have to show that you have contributed to the field in some way. And many times it's not just in the form of traditional scholarly journals, but it's in the form of projects, being a part of creating an, a museum exhibit, being a part of creating a documentary. Do you have any other current research projects that you're working on? Currently, I submitted a paper and it was accepted. Dr. Julie Decker, who's the editor of Collections, a journal for museums and archives professionals, is compiling a forthcoming publication. And my paper was peer reviewed and accepted. It's entitled Historical Markers and Signage and Public Programming Online at Public History Institutions, such as Museums and Archives, Volume 13, Number 3. Excellent. We'll keep that in mind uh, when it comes out. Perhaps that'll become one of our recommendations in a future episode. All right, cool. Before we wrap up, uh, Susie, do you have any history-related recommendation that you'd like to share with us today? One of my favorite museums is the Alex Jordan Jr.'s House on the Rock, and it's located near the vicinity of Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin, Spring Green, Wisconsin. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with those two I know of the Wright House, and they said it was the House on the Rock, right? Yes. I am vaguely familiar with that. I've read a couple things about it, but never, I've never been there, but it sounds really cool. I think it has one of the most fascinating collections, and it's housed in this eclectic structure. It's literally the house placed on top of deer shelter rock, which shuts out like the bow of the boat into the sea, but it's actually a cliff. It's quite scary. It's designed by Alex Jordan Jr., and the building itself is the biggest part of the collection, which I'm referring back to Peter Van Minch's theory on buildings as collections. It was opened in 1959. It's a continuation of the Barnum and Bailey circuses and fairs that captured America's attention at the turn of the 20th century. But it can also be represented as a curio cabinet of the turn of the 20th. 20th. It's not the sophisticated labeled contemporary museum that you would find in the 21st century with an abundance of interpretative materials, nor is it a palace or cathedral museum that we can tour in silence, but it's preserved in its natural state. And what I mean by natural is that the collector had designed it that way and it has not changed. So if we can look at some of these kinds of museums that are preserved in its natural state. I would say I'm going to compare it to the Pitt Rivers Museum at the University of Oxford and Sir John Soane's Museum in London. It's in its original setting or in situ as the founder had wanted. And the curator for the House on the Rock apparently comes to the museum once a month, and there's no definite figure of how many are on display. And just to give you a rough idea, there are about 250,000 dollhouses on display, and it's not even the highlight of the collection. That's amazing. <laughs> That's just so many dollhouses. And the focal collection isn't it's not a dollhouse. It's a primitive form of artificial intelligence or robotics, the automatons. And these mechanical devices were made quite popular at fairs, circuses, and railway stations in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And we can actually trace back automatons to the Middle Ages. But the ones inside the House on the Rock, tokens or coins are dropped into a box and it triggers a mechanical action. For example, the fortune teller automaton chooses a card and drops it under the machine for the visitor to pick up from the slot below to read the card that tells his or her future. But many of the larger musical automatons were custom built by the collector himself, Alex Jordan Jr. The smaller automatons, like the graveyard scene, are ex situ, or they're out of its original environment from British railway stations, so brought all the way to the United States, these rich American collectors. So the visitors are given tokens to choose which automatons to see move and play and music, and 
I think because of these qualities, it's one of the most interactive museums in the world that I've come across. And for the pop culturally minded among us all, your description actually reminded me of where I read about this. There's an author named Neil Gaiman who wrote a book called American Gods that was actually recently turned into a TV series on, I don't know, one of those cable channels I don't get, stars or something. But anyway, in the book, American Gods, they talk about that location, the rock, the house on the rock, is one of these mystical places in America where the gods gather because it's just so otherworldly <laughs> that it literally is otherworldly. And so the gods will go there to have meetings and they'll go into those dioramas, like the one you were talking about, the graveyard diorama. There's one scene in there where they actually talk about some of the gods like shrinking down and being in that diorama to have one of their meetings, and then they move on to something else. <laughs> but it's a probably a good, I don't know, two or three chapters in that book where, where the author talks about almost mystical feeling of of that location, uh, which was which which is really fun to read. Oh, that sounds very interesting. I have to take a look at that book. So, uh, James, do you have anything you'd like to share with us this week? Yes, because I've been doing so much reading lately. <laughs> um, oh, actually, good. No, actually, um, I haven't because of major initiatives at work, but I can share with you what is on bookshelf and up next for reading. It is a book by Phil Marcade called Punk Avenue, Inside the New York City Underground from 1972 to 1982. And if anybody has ever eavesdropped on Rob and my conversations over the phone, on the link, or at any time, they would know how interested we both are in music particularly 80s and um, for me especially uh the punk movement and how it was established in both england and in the u.s around the same time and doesn't necessarily pick up where um legs mcneil's please kill me book leaves off because that's very focused on the development of the early punk movement but uh punk avenue is it sounds like it's more um more focused on the new york underground legs talks about a lot of different bands that were involved in the initiation of the punk movement and i think that marcade's book is more focused on the history of the underground music scene in new york itself during that period so i'm very excited to add this uh to my reading list it's up next so we'll just have to see when i actually get to uh crack the binding I'm actually going to recommend another podcast that's kind of been on my mind lately. Is One of the very first podcasts I ever listened to back when I was a, a wee lad in grad school was Slate Magazine's Political Gab Fest. And one of the co-hosts on that, his name is John Dickerson, he is... He's the host of Face the Nation on CBS. But one of the other things that he does is he created a podcast of his own called Whistle Stop. It's a podcast for political junkies, basically. But what he does is he tells these stories about presidential politics. And so in the first season of it, what he called campaign curiosities. And so he would talk about people that ran for president that we'd never heard of, or he would talk about the scandals that engulfed political campaigns in the past. And so he had episodes on things like Grover Cleveland's sexual adventures back in 1896 and how that became a brief political scandal during the presidential run. And he talks about things like the fight between Ford and Reagan at the 1976 Republican National Convention. Some stuff we've heard about before, like Truman defeating Dewey in 1948 or JFK's speech in Virginia during the 1960 campaign where he tries to make this argument that it's okay for people to elect a Catholic for president, even though that had never been done before. So each episode is kind of this little, it's, it's like an extended anecdote, basically. Each one is, you know, 45 minutes, give or take. But in season two, he starts talking about oddball things that have happened to presidents in the White House after they get elected. And so there's things like the story of Andrew Jackson's inauguration, which turned into a complete disaster as all these people busted into the White House and got mud all over the, the White House furniture and all of that. But then he talks about things like Richard Nixon's tendency to record Oval Office conversations, which led to his downfall. Oliver North trying to get around the bureaucracy in Washington by, you know, selling weapons to the Iranians and then using the proceeds to fund anti-communist fighters in Nicaragua and other Central America and all of that. So anyway, it's a really interesting podcast. Uh, the host, John Derrickson, he's, he's an amusing guy. He's got a very goofy sense of humor, and that tends to come through also. Well, Susie, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. As always, if you have any questions or comments on this podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please send us an email at snhuhistory at gmail.com. For James Fennessy and Susie Chung, I'm Rob Denning. Thanks for listening. Have a good day. But I'm starting to forget names. I'm like, it why, happens. why is that name coming up? <laughs> I know it's
in the back of my mind somewhere, but I gotta yeah. find it. Yeah. I know. I called Rob Troll the other day. I just couldn't remember his name. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> that didn't happen. I would never call you Troll. Wow. You are not an internet troll. Sheesh, man. You're not our president. <laughs> Ooh, burn. <laughs> Ooh, burn, and he didn't even hear it. Right. Yeah, that's going to go into the outtakes. Great. <laughs> <clears throat> and thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. If you have any questions or podcasts on this comment, what the heck? I can only imagine that having a passport with a stamp from Cuba and another stamp from Iran, that would probably put you on someone's list somewhere. <laughs> <laughs>